Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar on protecting business information. Uh, my name is David Ashton. I'm an advisor with Business Station. Uh, so we'll make a start. Uh, we'll have some more people uh, joining us soon. But uh, this is just a, a first couple of slides, just a little bit of information about me and my experience. I'm a qualified auditor of information security management systems. So I work with uh, businesses on setting up policies and procedures around information security management and, and governance and, and the like. So uh, that's the experience I'm going to bring to this session. Um, what, uh, uh, and that's, yeah, so what we're going to be talking about is, is around, you know, is protecting your business information to ensure that you protect your own business, but also that of your clients and prospective clients. <laughs> so Business Station, just a bit about uh, what they do. As I said, I've been an advisor since 2014. So take advantage of Business Station services. We can help you with all sorts of matters to do with your business. Um, and the ASBAS program is, uh, or funds Business Station to provide these services so you can see the areas that we can assist you with. So what we're going to talk about today is um, just looking at how we can protect your business from uh, you know, fraud and corruption. You know, we tend to talk about corruption in the context of government, but it's also an issue within business. And you know, as your business grows and you bring on staff and contractors, you need to make sure that you have internal controls in place to protect information, assets, and the like. And that's what we'll be talking about in this session. We're gonna talk about privacy, so protecting personal information, um, personal information of your customers, your clients, and other stakeholders. Um, looking at some tools that you can implement, uh, government has uh, a program called the Essential eight around software or, or you know, uh, ICT security business continuity which is you know how you can continue business during cases of disruption uh, we're going to look at information security management systems so that's the the policies and procedures that you can implement to uh, improve security of your data information records and the like. Uh, I'm going to show you some slides on where there's some support from government to assist you in this regard and then we'll just uh, finish the presentation with a, with a brief summary of what we've discussed. Now where I'm looking at it from is when, when we talk about information security management you've sort of got your, your legal aspect of it so the laws that you have to comply with like the Privacy Act and, and the like. Then you've got your software element where you can purchase particular software and applications to assist in preventing cyber security attacks and like. Where I'm primarily coming from is you as a business owner, what sort of policies and procedures and management approach you can put in place to make sure all these things are actually happening and that you've got guidance for your employees to be able to manage and protect personal information, business information, I mean your business information, your client's business information and the like. So I'm looking at it very much from a management perspective rather than a legal or a, I guess a, a technical cyber software type component. So the first area we're going to look at is fraud and corruption within your business and, and obviously depending on the size of your business you know this these sort of things are going to be uh, more prevalent but you know we're talking about fraud in, in the context of people stealing money and assets from your know, corruption in terms of how they deal with external parties and as I said you probably hear a lot of these things in relation to government but it's normally private businesses that are part of the problem as well so we're going to look at this sort of thing so and, and you know, what, what you can do to help mitigate these problems. So what is fraud and corruption? So it's the intentional act of involving 
um, the use of deception to obtain an unjust or illegal advantage. Uh, for those of you that have just joined us, we've just uh, basically started. So if you've got any questions as we go, put them in the chat box uh, and I'll answer them and go, although we may be coming to the answer. And um, you'll receive a copy of this presentation uh, later on and also have access to the recording. So we're just talking about what is fraud and corruption and the internal controls you can put in place. Um, so intentional act of involving the use of deception to obtain an unjust or illegal advantage. Examples of fraud include the misappropriation of, of assets, so uh, using you know, resources for personal use when they're, they're not permitted to be, manipulation of financial reporting or external reporting, so you know, incorrectly completing your tax returns or other uh, legal uh, financial reporting that you have to do, Cause or loss, causing loss or liability through deception, uh, false invoicing for goods or services, backdating agreements, exaggerated fictitious accident harassment or injury claims, misuse of legal, uh, leave entitlement. So these are examples of some fraud that can happen in your business and you know, invoicing of goods and services is a good example where you know someone is uh, you know uh, charging more than what it actually is and you know additional funds are being hived off into their back personal bank account rather than into your business account so you can put in place various procedures to mitigate that this which is what we'll talk about so what's corruption dishonest behavior by those in positions of power um, they act contrary to the interests of the business abuse of trust in order to achieve personal gain for themselves or someone else. So it's really basically, you know, a, a, an employee or a contractor that you've engaged that's using your business, your resources, your money to enrich themselves to their benefit and not yours. So examples, so secret commissions, bribes, you know, releasing your confidential information for an improper purpose, manipulating a tender process, um, dishonestly using influence, blackmail, not disclosing any gifts or hospitality, misuse of the internet or email. So unauthorised release of confidential private information. <laughs> Sorry, or intellectual property. So, you know, you as a business owner, as I said, yeah, I mean, if you're a single person business then I mean a bit hard to com commit fraud and corruption against yourself but it's more of a case of as you grow your business and you bring on staff and the like you need to have in place internal controls to protect your finances protect your assets protect personal client and business information and it's about establishing policies and procedures to give guidance to staff as to what is expected of them in relation to these matters so these sort of problems don't arise. And if they do arise, you have mechanisms in place to be able to terminate employment, um, to uh, get uh, funds back, uh, mitigate any insurance issues and the like. So it also provides comfort to your um, clients uh, that you've got uh, good processes in place to prevent um, their their business as well. So, you know, preventing fraud and corruption. So develop and implement policies and procedures. You need to have a commitment to those policies and procedures at all levels. Identify potential risks and develop, you know, risk treatment plans for those. Um, undertake due diligence on prospective employees, contractors and suppliers. So, you know, referee details and all that sort of stuff. You know, communication to and training for employees and contractors. So again, you've got a suite of policies and procedures in place to prevent fraud and corruption control. You need to train your employees, you know, your new employees, your induction processes um, and, and that type of thing. So, and then monitor and review. So internal audits, you know, you might be big enough to engage an external auditor to come in and make sure that these things aren't happening and then put in place mechanisms to enforce and sanction um, against uh, 
you know, this sort of uh, thing from happening in your business. Uh, there is some uh, procedures that you can put in place around good governance. So there's an Australian standard, 8,000 that you can use um, to assist in that regard. So some of the policies that you could put in place and procedures, so code of conduct, uh, conflict of interest, uh, reporting fraud and corruption, so whistleblower, uh, receipt of um, hospitality and gifts, personal files access, so you know who in your organisation should have access to records and documents and other files, policies and procedures around the recruitment, selection and induction of new staff, you know, leave management, flexible working arrangements, which have you know, become important over the last 12 months. So if you've got staff working from home, you know, what sort of uh, expectations are in place to ensure protection of your business. Looking at risk management, travel, so use of uh, company uh, vehicles, um, use of private vehicles and reimbursement of travel allowance and what, and use of the corporate credit card if you've got one of those and you know if you're still using petty cash and things like that so procedures around how you're going to manage your business to ensure a good um, service to your customers and clients to protect your customers and clients to protect your business but also um, you know marketing your business as a credible and safe organization for someone to want to do business with so other procedures, you know, procurement and contract management, your financial policies and procedures and various internal controls around separation of duties and, and the like. Um, looking at confidentiality and release of official information. So who has access to it and in what capacity can be released to third parties. Uh, procedures and policies around disciplining staff that, that don't do the right thing and put in place acceptable use of uh, you know, your computer systems and access to internet and social media and the like. So, and you know, use of uh, you know, business telephones. You know, on what basis can these be used for personal use? So these are some measures that you can put in place to prevent fraud and corruption in your business and, and obviously depending on the size of your business will determine the extent of the policies and procedures that you will engage with and, and also looking at things like contracts of employment um, you can get some templates from Fair Work Australia and the ombudsman on that, that cover off on some of these sorts of matters in that contract of employment so now we're going to look at, uh, at privacy. So privacy is generally around personal information. So collecting personal information about your customers. So credit card details, names, addresses, telephone numbers. You know, I think with COVID at the moment, with the you know the sign into premises, you know people can do that manually. So they're they're putting their full name, their telephone number on there. I'm, I'm not sure that that's the best um, uh, way to ensure personal protection of information if everyone else looking at that sheet can see names and telephone numbers so perhaps the app is the app that uh, the, is the best way to do that um, but you know you need to um, there is a legislative requirement for business to have policies and procedures around personal information and this slide here has a definition of what personal information is, um, you know, information on an opinion about an identified individual, uh, whether the information is true or not, and whether the information is recorded in material form or not. So it's basically any personal information that you would collect that would identify um, an individual that you do business with. And from my point of view, I extend this to your clients and your, your customers. And, and other organisations that you deal with in relation to managing your business because they need to be satisfied, as do you in your dealings with them, that business information can be protected. So it's not uh, getting to people that shouldn't have access to it, 
particularly in relation to your business information and access by competitors. So the Privacy Act uh, is, uh, is the uh, legislative backing here, Privacy Act 1988, it's a Commonwealth legislation. Some states have their own legislation, but the purpose of it is to regulate how business collects information, stores it, disposes of it, provides access to users and discloses personal information to third parties. So you need to develop a range of policies and procedures around how you do these things. How do you collect information? Uh, as I said, yeah, someone's paying with a credit card, you, you're collecting details about that. You know, you might have a, a newsletter that you send out to your you know, customers and, and clients. You know, you're obviously collecting a, possibly a name and an email. So how do you collect it? How do you use it? What do you use it for? How you store it? Who has access to it? So th there is some legal requirements. So, so businesses with turnover greater than $3 million must have a privacy policy that documents all these things. It's exempt for smaller businesses, but you're encouraged to opt in if you deal with personal information of your customers um, so it, it's handy to have that sort of thing. And a lot of these things are put up on websites and, and like, or displayed in um, uh, the business if it's a, a retail business. So you need, in terms of protecting personal information, you need, need to maintain a strong security posture around your policies and procedures. You know, you need to have, you know, comprehensive, security plan, so identify the types of information that's collected um, and, and process, identify any applicable laws and regulations that may apply to that. You also need to then determine your processes for collecting, uh, using, storing, accessing and disposing of information. So, yeah, we're not just talking here about personal information, but also your own internal business information, you know, what do you collect? How do you store it? Who has access to it in your business? You know, not every employee needs to have access to every record or document that you keep and how do you dispose of it? And, you know, I think it's, you know, things like storage is important. You know, obviously if you're storing electronically, the more records and documents you keep, the more storage capacity you need and from an electronic, you know, the, you know, cloud environment or whatever that comes with a cost. Uh, likewise, if you've got a lot of paper records and you need to have filing cabinets, compactness, and you know that takes up at least floor space, which comes at a cost. Uh, who in your organisation has access to it? So, um, as I said, you need to have some policies around who should have access to what and how you dispose of it. And and you are entitled to dispose of records once they've reached the end of useful life. So you know, with your finance and accounting records for your tax returns, you don't need to keep them forever. So after you know, seven years you, you do, or five years, depending on what type of record it is, you can uh, delete that and dispose of it from your system. So don't keep any records that you're not required legally to keep. Um, but having said that, there may be some records of the business nature that you do want to keep. There might be some you know, historical records or all the like. So you need to identify you know, what information you have and then put in place some policies and procedures around how you're going to manage them. So look at your risk register. So you know, identify risks in, in how information is collected, used, stored, accessed and disposed. So you know, make sure that uh, you comply with relevant privacy laws you're not uh, inadvertently mishandling personal data, so that's, you know, people get access to personal information and they're, they're not required to, and that there are, um, you know, risk mitigation around data breaches as well and cyber security attacks. So, you know, things that you can do to prevent this, so, you know, look at customer privacy policies, legal compliance, data protection throughout the, the lot lifestyle of that data from, say, from the date that you collect it to the date that you dispose of that and look at uh, procedures around how you can deal with early detection of breaches 
and identify who the intruders are, whether they be internal or external. You may need to report misuse or breaches of policies and procedures and um, data breaches. Uh, and one of the controls is to, you know, with new employees, you know, in the induction process, um, you know, outline the expectations, have them sign off on policies and procedures around um, the sort of, you know, personal and business information. And when they leave the organisation, have the processes in place to ensure that you, you know, terminate passwords, you collect any keys and access cards and anything uh, of a business nature that they would have access to, you collect from them and, and also within the contract of employment, you would put in place um, some clauses around privacy of business information during you know, the time that they're obviously employed with you, but also um, after they leave employment. And you know, from your own point of view as the business owner or manager, you know, conduct regular audits to make sure that good policies and procedures are in place, they're relevant and up to date, and um, they're being followed and implemented by your staff. Uh, if you need some assistance on um, privacy, uh, you can access the Office of Australian Information Commissioner who will um, assist you with uh, putting in place a privacy framework uh, for your business. And uh, as I said, depending on the size of your business will determine the extent to that to which you have to go through and the extent of documentation and policies and procedures you put in place. So some uh, standards and, and legislation that you might come across, uh, particularly, um, and, and I've, today I've conducted two other webinars on tender writing and grants. And, um, you know, you're gonna get questions in your tender, submit, you know, the tender process and through the grant process about your policies and procedures around how you manage information in your business and customer privacy and the like. So having good policies and procedures in place and being across relevant legislation and standards can be can assist you in that regard. You don't need to be an expert on it, but you need, at least need to understand that these things are, are in place and, and what they're about. So good governance principles, so that's an Australian standard um, that you know, talks about good governance. So fraud and corruption, whistleblower, um, codes of conduct, that type of thing. Information security management system, so that's standard which we'll talk about a bit later on. So that's the processes to manage as the secure information. Privacy Act, which is what we just sort of talked about. Um, if you're dealing with European companies, um, then they have a similar privacy regime that you need to be across and comply with. And if you're tendering for government work, state, local, federal, um, they would have, uh, there may be some requirements within the contract to manage records in accordance with the relevant State Records Act or Commonwealth Records Act, and also Freedom of Information Act. So just, uh, you know, if you can demonstrate an understanding of this sort of information, that will help you in terms of your tender and grant writing. So that sort of fraud and corruption privacy, so some practical measures that you can put in place to protect personal and business implementation, uh, information, sorry, but also satisfy your prospective and current clients that you know their information is secure um, and, and that you're a safe pair of hands for you know, prospective businesses to want to come and do business with you. So what the, um, the, the government, federal government has done through the uh, cyber security um, channels that they've set up is they've, they've come up with this, what they call the essential eight uh, to help small and medium businesses um, protect against cyber security threats. And I've just got some, a few slides just outlining some of the 
basic concepts of this, um, and it is designed for small and medium businesses. I've given you a website there where you can go and access further information and some templates and, and tools to help you implement this thing. But there's three sort of control levels in you know, malware delivery and execution, you know, limiting the extent of cybersecurity incidents and, and then recovering data and system availability. So, um, so it's designed to, um, you know, target cyber security and prevent, you know, intrusion and access to your data. You know, making sure that um, there isn't monetary gain so that they're not, you know, you know, accessing your bank accounts and credit cards and that sort of thing there. So it's really a range of measures from a, you know, a, a software um, ICT basis to prevent access to your corporate data. So uh, while I said earlier that my focus of this discussion is around the management side of it, having a good management system in place will ensure that these sort of things are implemented. So th these slides sort of provide a bit of detail and so I won't go into too much detail on this because I want to focus more on the management of it, but you know, application whitelisting, so making sure that only certain things need to be installed on your computer systems, not everything. Don't, you know, just because it's sort of supplied from a software package, it doesn't mean it has to be installed necessarily. Uh, patch applications, so, um, you yeah, know, when you're making changes to computer programs and the like. So looking at Microsoft macros, only allowing trusted uh, macros and that to, to operate within your um, computer system and block macros from the internet. So application hardening, so it's, this is around sort of reverse engineering and being able to tamper with finished products. So restrict administrative privileges. So again, this is getting back to that fraud and corruption and, and who has access to what. As I said, no one, not every employee needs access to everything to do with your, your system. So put in place um, you know, access provisions, who has access to what, how they access it, and the means by which they access it. Patch operating systems. So you yeah, know, looking at the design, update, fixing or improving the systems using the latest operating systems. Multi-factor authorization, so you know, two passwords, um, two different types of access. So you might have a combination of a password and a smart card um, and the like. So, um, yeah, so you can put in place measures around uh, passwords and the like. Regular backups of your uh, information to ensure that it's protected and store those backups offline or off site. Uh, depending, again, depending on the size of your business, you know, you might have a portable hard drive. So, you know, store that somewhere secure. Uh, or if you're storing it on the cloud, that type of thing. So, but you know, when you're looking at backup arrangements, do your research on what type of um, uh, systems and, and procedures and other uh, resources are available to you. So now we're going to look at business continuity. So, you know, what happens if there's a um, or your internet goes down for a few hours or there's a blackout and the power goes down or um, yeah, something that's going to disrupt your day-to-day -day operations and prevent you from delivering your services or your products to your customers. And what this is, is about, you know, how do you make sure that you can still deliver 
when you're faced with those disruptions. And, you know, I talk about this in the context of tendering and uh, for work uh, with government organisations is that they want to make sure that no matter what the circumstances, you can deliver what they want and when they want it. So, I mean, for example, if you're a, a cleaning company and you, uh, you, you've got a job to strip and seal floors ready for in a hall, ready for a function on Saturday night, and you, you've been asked to do that on Wednesday and you, your polishes break down, you know, what happens? Does the work get delayed or do you have backup machinery in place to be able to um, continue the job? Likewise, with your employees, what happens if they go on leave? Who steps up to take over their work in periods of leave? So that's what business continuity really is about. It's a management process that identifies threats to an organisation and the impacts to business operations. And then you put in place a framework to build resilience and diminish and avoid that disruption. So no matter what the circumstances, whether it be equipment breakdown, staff leave, uh, um, you know, staff on sick leave or, or whatever, uh, the internet going down, the power going down, whatever, no matter what the circumstances, you can still deliver to your client or your customer what they want and when they want it. So, you know, minimise the risk and vulnerability. So, I mean, obviously, uh, a mechanism with a laptop computer, if the power goes down, well, you've got backup battery in place. Um, so there, there's an example, um, you know, plant and equipment, you might have, you know, an arrangement with a hire company to hire equipment in the case of, you know, equipment, you know, not working. Um, you might have backup personnel that you can bring in uh, during periods of leave. They're sort of examples of you know, business continuity measures. And I've given you a template there. There's a website you can go to. And uh, yeah, basically what it is, how are you going to deal with your business and run your business when things go wrong and or things don't go to plan? So you can use that template to develop a business continuity plan. And, you know, in, in understanding the planning process, identify the risks and the impact to your business. So what is the impact? So a risk is obviously loss of internet connection. Uh, what's the risk to your business? And what is the, and then develop the strategy to mitigate that risk, you know, document that in a plan, implement the plan, test it and review and maintain it. So business continuity is really a risk management tool that you can ensure that no matter what the circumstances you can um, deliver to your customers. So, you know, the plan should outline the risks that you face, incorporate, you know, the identification, the prioritization of those critical business processes that may be impacted by that risk, uh, and then procedures in place to reduce the risk and limit their um, impact on your business operations. And also look at the conditions for activating the plans. Look at some emergency procedures and, and that you may implement. And look at what your fallback procedures are. So as I said, you know, what is your fallback if the internet goes down, for example, or what is the fallback in place if a piece of plant equipment you know, breaks down or you know, what happens if you're having to travel to meet a client and your, your car won't start? You know, what are you going to do in that situation? So, again, it's, it's providing that comfort to your clients and your customers that no matter what the circumstance, you're still going to be able to deliver them the service that they expect. Uh, so, look at, you know, resumption procedures and returning to normal. I mean, COVID-19 is a classic example of business continuity. I mean, it was sprung on us at the, with no notice and we all had to act to maintain our business. So, you know, people work from home. Uh, we put in place a whole range of measures to ensure business continuity. Uh, you know, retail, you know, restaurants weren't allowed to have diners in restaurants. So a lot of them moved to, you know, takeaway. 
which they may not have provided that before. Uh, so what, but having said that, a lot of those measures that were put in place were reacting to a problem. The question is, did they have plans in place to deal with a situation like that in the first place? And that's, that's what business continuity is. It's identifying all the risks that could, that could prevent you from continuing your business and then put in place plans that if those risks do arise, that you've got a plan in place to continue business. So um, that, that's really what it's about. So you're not reacting to events, you're anticipating events and then putting in place a plan to deal with it. So you've got that smooth transition to the new way that you're gonna do business during that interruption. So that's essentially what business continuity planning is. And as I said, you will probably get a question about this in your tender submission or a business grant application. And hence why I run these sort of workshops to help business better manage and grow their business. So the next area we're gonna talk about is the actual nuts and bolts of it, the information security management system. So this is all the policies and procedures that you can put in place for your business. And there is a, an international standard, 27,001, that can, you can use to guide you in that. It's all about scale. You know, the bigger your business, the more complex. If it's, you, if it's just you and a laptop, then obviously you would put some measures in place to protect you. If it's you and a couple of employees, then that's going to require a little bit more rigor in the types of procedures that you put in place. So an information security management system is policies and procedures involved in an organisation's information security risk management processes. So policies and procedures to help you manage your information and protect it from people that shouldn't have access to it. It applies a risk management approach and it can help SMEs in any sector keep information assets secure. So really it's just policies and procedures. Could be a one page statement. Could be a one pager with a few dot points. If this happens, do that. Uh, purpose, so it's designed to examine your security risks, help you develop and implement policies and procedures to manage those risks and help you adopt a management process to ensure that controls continue to meet your security needs. So as your business changes, as it grows, uh, you know, uh, as new issues, external and internal arise, that you're constantly reviewing it to make sure that you've got the right processes in place. So the structure of this uh, standard is, is as per the screen there, the um, introductory statements, but it's really the requirements from four to 10 that you need to develop some policies and procedures around. Um, so the first stage is to determine your organisational context. So this is looking at yeah, the, the basis of your organisation, internal issues, external. So you know, developing a business plan, for example, you understand your internal and external environment. So looking at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunity and threats. What are some of the political, economic, technological, uh, technological and um, social issues what are some of the legal issues you know the legal issues that you've got to um, comply with and also the environment in which you operate so these sort of the factors that would determine your context as an organization as a business owner you need to demonstrate leadership so if you're putting in place these policies and procedures then you need to um, you know, adhere to them as well and you know, ensure proper training in that to assist with implementation. You need to put in place some plans to achieve the outcomes that you're hoping to obtain from uh, this pr uh, process and mitigate those risks and also improve business performance so that you're constantly looking at ways and means to um, improve your information security management. Um, and then to determine the resources required to support the management system. So again, it's all about scale. 
as I said, you know, what, uh, depending on the size of your business, um, you know, it could be just a couple of one page flow charts outlining what to do in certain circumstances. Uh, you need to plan, implement, control, and maintain the processes needed to develop, implement, and maintain an ISMS. So, um, yeah, that's all about the procedural development, operational procedures. You need to evaluate performance. So you need to ensure that the procedures that you put in place are actually effectively achieving um, improved information security management. And then you need to identify you know, what we call non-conformities, so things that aren't working properly and put in place measures to correct those and then over time improve performance. So you don't want those sort of non-conformities happening all the time. So as part of this, we need to put in place a policy. So it needs to be appropriate to your organisation. Um, it's just really a one page statement of intent. Really, yeah, we hope to achieve this by doing that. And it's going to be the responsibility of these people to ensure that it happens. So it provides a framework for setting the, the quality objectives around your ISMS. Um, and it needs to have a commitment to satisfy the applicable requirements, which we'll talk about later, and also a commitment to continuously improve. And you have to document that. So as I said, a, you know, a one page policy, it's got to be communicated. So you might want to put this on your internet or you need to communicate that to your, your suppliers and your customers and your, your other stakeholders that you deal with. And it needs to be available uh, when requested. So if people want to see it, they need to uh, be able to see it. So you need to set objectives. Um, you know, this is what you want to achieve. So consistent with the policy. So objectives could be around, um, you know, no incidences of a security breach, uh, no incidences of misuse of information, no incidences of misappropriation of uh, finances. They're the sort of measures that you put in place. Look at it in the context of your risk assessment. Uh, so obviously the objective, if, if I identified a risk, then the objective is to make sure that that risk doesn't materialize. You need to monitor them to make sure that you're achieving those objectives. You need to communicate that to your staff to ensure that they implement the processes to ensure that those objectives are achieved and you need to review those and update them as they are required to suit your business at any given point in time. So in support of the policy, you need to develop various procedures to maintain the processes, you know, meet the requirements, implement plans, perform the risk assessments and put in place the risk treatment plan. So the standard requires um, certain documentation. Um, so you've got to develop a document outlining what your scope of the information security management system is. Um, you know, so because it might not apply to all aspects of your business, you've got to have a, a written policy, you've got to have written objectives, you've got to have a risk treatment plan, you've got to have a statement of applicability, which I'll talk about later. And yeah, so then the risk treatment plan, risk assessment, and the methodology around how you assist risk. You've also got to have a, an assessment report. You've got to de de define the security roles and responsibilities. So who in your organization is going to be responsible for all this? You need to develop an inventory of your assets, procedures and policies around acceptable use of assets and access control policy. So again, who has access to information and use of assets. So the risk treatment, so you need to identify your risks, identify the um, consequences and the likelihood of those risks, and then put in place um, risk treatment strategies to make sure that those risks don't uh, materialise. Also, you can look at what opportunities are available to you that you can implement and take advantage of to uh, ensure a, a, a well-managed um, ISMS. So 
in outlining your um, your risks and your your control objectives and the measures that you're going to put in place, this um, the standard has what's called Annex A reference control objectives and control measures, um, and it contains a list of all the in all, all the things that you can do to ensure proper management of information and security of that information. So it is a good starting point for you to um, be able to put in place some simple policies and procedures around that. So these are the you know, information policies, organisational security, HR, asset management, access control, you can see there the 14 areas of controls that you put in place. And the next few slides are just outlined there. So information security policy, so that sets the direction for IS management. Uh, organisation of information security, so that's the, um, the management framework, the policies and procedures that you put in place. And also, um, some procedures around use of mobile devices and security of mobile devices and, and working from home policies and procedures. So, you know, if you're providing a laptop to your employee and they take that home for the night, you know, how do they store that at home and make sure others don't get access to it? You know, they're, you know they're, they're, they've got that in the car, you know, do they let, if they, they're going out, you know, they, they leave their vehicle, they're going to leave the laptop sitting on the front seat, you know, make sure that they perhaps store it in the boot, for example. So you can put in place some procedures around mobile devices and working from home or working remotely, looking at your HR security. Um, so again, you know, recruitment, selection, induction, um, you know, their, their uh, access to information and that while they're employed, but also when they terminate their employment or change their employment status, that, um, you know, certain access controls are removed from them uh, during that time. Looking at asset management, so who's responsible for assets, and I've got a, uh, a webinar tomorrow morning at eight o'clock Perth time on protecting assets, uh, responsibility for assets, uh, classification and media handling. So that's talking about the form the assets take, so um, di you know, different uh, means of handling that information. Access control, which we talked about, so who, who in your business has access to what information. Cryptography, so um, you know, ensuring confidentiality, authenticity and integrity of data. Physical environmental security, so you know, if you've got an office environment, you know, does everyone need to have access to particular parts of your office? And who has access to equipment within your office? Does everyone need to, you know, have access to the filing cabinets? If you've got paper records, for example, where do you store those filing cabinets? Operational security. So this is all uh, where the essential eight uh, would fit into as well. That we talked about earlier so you know backups and you know operational software and logging and monitoring and, and the like communication so who has access to the network you know your acquisition and development and maintenance of uh, hardware and software how's it done who has access to it what control measures are in place. Supplier relationships, I mean, you know, if you're uh, not just suppliers, but customers and other stakeholders, if you're entering to uh, contracts with the with other third parties, that you make sure that you have provisions in the contract around information security management and access and control of your business information. So you can protect yourself that way. Incident management, so what happens if something does happen? Watch your processes in place to correct that as soon as possible to minimise the impact. And you know, business continuity, which we've talked about. So 
you know, the security continuity redundancies put in place around backups and the like, you know, storing information off site, um, storing stuff in, you know, for paper records, make sure that, you know, they're stored in fireproof cabinets and, and and those sorts of things. And then and then looking at your compliance requirements. So not only your legal compliance, uh, but also your contractual compliance with your customers, clients and the like. So making sure that you're complying with contracts that are in place as well. And then, you know, undertake reviews of your security measures. So that's really the whole um, process of information security management. As I said, I think it's, in, it's very in, increasingly important to have some good policies and procedures in place. It's certainly questions that you're going to get asked about in tenders and grant applications. So if you want to win a tender, you, you're probably going to have to demonstrate good security management of information. It's you know, about that organisational capacity. And you may very well get some questions from existing and prospective customers and clients and contractors and suppliers. So if you can demonstrate good systems and procedures, and that, that's going to add to your credibility as a business. So uh, there is some support from government. So um, cyber.gov.au, the Australian Cyber Security Centre. So go and have a look at that website. And then there's an organisation called OzCyber, which um, does a lot of work with uh, small and medium sized businesses to help them get to improve their cyber security. So, and then uh, the earlier website was the Office of the Information Commissioner. Um, so in conclusion then, so thanks for participating. Um, you know, a successfully implemented information security management system will have you know, top management commitments. So you, you as the business owner, making sure that you, you do these things, um, commitment from other employees, uh, you'll communicate and consult with key people and organisations to help you inform the procedures. You'll develop good policies and procedures. Um, you'll allocate sufficient resources to make sure that these things are in place and are working effectively. You'll integrate it with all your other business processes. You'll monitor it and measure it for, to ensure that it's performing well and you'll document evidence of implementation because that's the sort of things that an auditor may want to see. And I believe it'll lead to, um, well, secure business information in all forms, whether it be paper or record, um, reduce information security costs because you know, you've got robust systems in place. I think it'll allow you to adequately respond to any security threats. So, you know, do you have a COVID-19 safe plan or a pandemic plan or something like, like that in place, like many organisations are having to do? Um, so, yeah, as I said, identify the risks to your business continuity and put in place measures to ensure that those risks don't impact your business. And confidentially of data, um, yours and your customers, It'll increase your resilience from a cyber attack and fulfill compliance obligations, business integrity and business growth. So that's my contact details. Thank you for participating. And uh, if you have any further questions, I'm happy to do a follow up for a one to one advisory session with you. So thanks for that and good luck with your endeavours.